Greetings on this great anniversary day to Wolfville Baptist Church. It is indeed a privilege to share some thoughts about our Baptist heritage. And uh, I, I certainly want to recognize that if you're counting from 1778, then uh, this would be our 242nd anniversary as a church, as a congregation. But if you're taking the longer route, from the 1760s, about 1763, then uh, we're about 257 years old. So, great time to celebrate, to reflect, to think about the pilgrimage and the heritage of the people called Baptist. But it's not just Wolfville Baptist Church, beloved congregation as we are, that uh, I want to talk mostly about in this uh, set of reflections today. Instead, I wanna go about 153 years even earlier, back into the early 17th century, and I wanna talk about the very first congregation that called themselves Baptist in any sense of the word. I'm talking about the John Smith congregation that came over to Amsterdam from uh, various parts of the Midlands um, about this time of year in blustery October. They crossed the channel in several boats by stealth, um, leaving their homes, in some cases their spouses, their children, their family. Uh, it was a very uh, exciting and challenging opportunity that gave them uh, pause to leave their country and go to another place, perhaps where things might be a little less uh, adversarial. And then by the following spring, we are told in 1608, most of the 50 people or so in that first congregation were there in Amsterdam, just in their honor because they are our ancestors we're talking about people from the membership roster of that early congregation, like Hugh and Anne Bromhead, like John and Mary Grindall, like Thomas Jessup, Jerome Neville, the Piggott family, Francis, Margaret, Thomas, Ailes, and Mother Piggott, uh, John Smith and his wife Mary, Elizabeth Thomas Thompson, and uh, altogether, there were about 42 plus eight others who are associated with the congregation, English people who fled to Amsterdam in Holland. So that's the identity of the church that we want to kind of focus in on today as we try and think about through uh, some uh, material aspects, what an early Baptist might have looked like or sounded like or thought like. Now, why in the world did these people, our theological and religious ancestors, end up in the Netherlands, in Holland of all places? Well, without going into all of the uh, internecine wars that were going on between the Spanish and the uh, English and the Dutch, um, the Netherlands were a place of free trade, a lot of commercial activity, and uh, they were a gathering point for a number of small cottage industries that were on the make. So there was a manpower shortage in Amsterdam and Leiden and uh, other cities in uh, the Netherlands, and that I'm sure was an attraction to people who were suddenly uh, without job, without home, without livelihood. So that's a, that's a principal reason why they came to Amsterdam. Amsterdam has been considered by Baptist historians and others for a long time to be a, a relatively safe place. In fact, it wasn't altogether safe. Even after they arrived and even after they were taken in by Mennonite friends and, and co-religionists, the English arm of the law was never very far. There were English military uh, 
of people stationed in Amsterdam. There were spies who were always on the lookout for people like dissenters who had created an issue with uh, one or more of the laws of, of the realm back in England. So here we are in 1607, 1608, with a group of people who are purely English, and I'll come back to say something about that in a moment, and where do they go? What money did they have? What wherewithal did they have? Well, as the story goes, um, a very generous Mennonite man who was a baker, Jan Munter by name and his family, ran a very successful bakery in the heart of Amsterdam, located fronting on the Amstel River. Uh, it was a multi-story bakehouse that probably dated back to, uh, best guesses, 1570, 1580. Uh, it was made of brick, um, and it, it had as its uh, uh, productivity supplying hard tack biscuits in mass to the Navy, uh, to the navies, uh, and to long-distance commercial traders. We remember that the Dutch had trading routes that reached all the way to the East Indies. And so a cheap, and I suppose a nourishing kind of uh, carbohydrate product would have been a hardtack biscuit. So I asked my wife to make some biscuits. Here's my first uh, show and tell. You know, when I was in school, I just lived for show and tell days because uh, they were an opportunity for us kids to sort of make a contribution. So I want to leave you, first of all, with this artifact. I'm not going to try and eat it. If it had been hardtack, uh, then I would have had a hard time with my teeth. Many sailors actually lost because of the uh, interaction of the salt water weather on their teeth and uh, systems, they actually lost their teeth chewing on these things along with beer or ale that was taken along. I also have to be careful because my wife Kitty, who baked the biscuits, said, I don't want to be known as making hard tack biscuits. But you get the point that Jan Munter and his family produced significant amounts of biscuits and I'm sure other sweet doughs and, and because they traded in spices there on uh, the Amstel River. The bakehouse that we're talking about was a multi-story structure. It was a large structure. There are some uh, etchings of it that come out of the 19th century, but essentially it was built like this. Uh, the front of it, which uh, faced the Amstel River, an area that uh, now includes Rembrandt Platz, which is a nice gathering place in the city. That would have had the, uh, the store, if you will, where biscuits and other baked goods, breads were, were uh, displayed, but also it would have been the place where just behind the actual activity, the ovens that baked the biscuits were constructed and they would have been brick ovens. And behind that structure, in two or three stories, behind that front part, uh, were rooms described as cottages. What were they for? They were Jan Munter's provision for those that he would like to intern in learning the trade of baking. And so here was this sort of hotel or motel, if you will, in the offing that from time to time might have well had extra rooms for people that came through Amsterdam. One of the historians that has written a lot about the bakehouse and the early Smith congregation has suggested that probably John Smith, who was back and forth between England and across the channel to Amsterdam quite a bit, probably made some pre-arrangements with the uh, Munter family about uh, taking care of this refugee group that would be coming. And so Jan Munter, 
a Mennonite, a practicing faithful Mennonite, uh, gave solace as these people began to arrive. Up to 50 of them by early spring in 1608. Now, it obviously was crowded. Uh, we are prone to believe that uh, two things happened to the group once they were there. First is that uh, those who wanted to find work uh, did so in the textile and pottery uh, and carrying industries right around in that area and probably moved out into rooms of their own. And secondly, in what would become typically Baptist fashion, they experienced at least two serious church splits where they disagreed over interaction with Mennonites, they disagreed over aspects of the doctrine of Christ, uh, they disagreed over uh, the question of, of atonement, for whom did Christ die? So we know that with Thomas Helwes, with Elias Tukey, and with others who actually went back to be part of the earlier ancient church of English independent congregationalists, uh, that that number of 50 probably was whittled down to maybe more in the neighborhood of a consistent 20 to 25 people. The Baptist actually occupied rooms and space in the Jan Munter Bakehouse as late as 1650. We know that in several generations. After that, studies have shown that uh, Baptists no longer came to uh, uh, reside in exile in Amsterdam. Uh, they had their own communities in uh, the Netherlands, elsewhere, and so the, the history of the bakehouse being important to Baptists is from about 1607 to 1650. Now, what makes this all very real to me, and I hope I can convey it to you, is um, the poignancy of an artifact that has survived. I want to read from James Coggins' work about the different kinds of people of which our ancestors were a part that came through the Netherlands. The Dutch Reformed Church often urged the magistrates in Amsterdam to enforce their religion and suppress all others. The magistrates, as magistrates are prone to do, desiring all the economic and political support they could obtain, just as often tolerated Jews, free thinkers, Mennonites, English separatists, and later the Arminian dissenters, the free willers, from the Dutch Reformed Church, also called Remonstrance. Now, as we walk with these people down the canals and along the river, this is what Coggins says about Amsterdam, the new home. Amsterdam was the largest, wealthiest, and most tolerant city in the wealthiest, most urbanized, and most tolerant province in Holland. The immigrants found work in the least skilled and lowest paid occupations, particularly in textiles, which had arisen late in the 20th, in the, uh, uh, century. Now, the artifact that I've got bears a little bit of explanation. When I was serving for the Baptist World Alliance, which also celebrates Baptist World Heritage Day this month, so we're in good shape, um, we met in Amsterdam. We met at the Singelkirk, which is the combined Mennonite uh, Baptist congregation there on the Singel Canal. And uh, one of the people who was in attendance at that meeting took the president, Noel Vos, and I uh, for a walk around in the area, and he brought us to a lot which was virtually a brick pile wreck of a place, piles and piles of old bricks. And he said, what you are looking at is the former uh, site of the uh, John Munter Bakehouse. 
It was finally mostly destroyed in bombing raids during World War II, but uh, the rubble that had occurred had not yet by that time been cleaned up. This was in 1999. So Dr. Vos and I, Vos was a, an Australian historian with some Canadian connections. Dr. Vos and I walked over and sort of rummaged through the brick pile, picked out three bricks and asked permission if we could have these as souvenirs. And the guide said, sure. And he went over and double checked with another person. Baptist would not want to be caught stealing bricks from the establishment in any way or private property. And we were told, of course, the more you can carry away, the less we'll have to clean up uh, when we actually get to renovating this lot. So from that point in time, I have been in possession of what I consider to be a Baptist sacred relic. A brick authentically from Jan Munter's bakehouse. Uh, I had a person who was uh, a brickwork uh, producer tell me that the uh, oyster shell substance of the mortar that's on this brick is authentic to the period. But here is, here is an actual artifact from the very location of the place where in 1607-08, the first soon to become called Baptist congregation uh, was founded. A very precious item. Now, I'm one, when I go to the beach, I, uh, I often pick up rocks. My mother-in-law had a habit of doing this. And some of the rocks um, I'll put up to my head and wonder if you could speak, what would the message be? So I have this kind of nutty, rocky thing about what would the stones say if they could speak? It's biblical, if you remember, from the Old Testament where the landmarks continue to have a witness as the stones were still in place throughout the history of ancient Israel. So I want you to walk with me and listen with me for my take on what would a brick say if it could give witness to what it had seen and what it had heard 400 years ago. And it seems to me at the very beginning of our sense of what we might hear from this brick is refugeeism. This brick was an obvious witness as the walls around it to peoples of many kinds and maybe many kinds of faith, religious experiences that came through the generosity of the Mennonites to be repopulated in a place that was freer and more liberal about tolerating various religious views. This little, relatively speaking, group of huddling English refugees, and I want to stress the word refugee, because in the world we are living today, this brick continues to speak. Homeless, culturally estranged, language deficient, unemployed, having suffered great persecution. Let me unpack that. They had homes that they left and they were seized by the authorities. Yes, they did suffer persecution. There are books written about early Baptist martyrs in England. Uh, they suffered persecution by having their property seized, by being put in prison. One of our great uh, fathers in the faith, along with his wife, Thomas and Joan Helwitz, were separated. Uh, she was put in prison on the threat of bringing him back so that uh, they could prosecute Thomas. So they were certainly uh, persecuted. They were culturally estranged. These people had never lived anywhere but in the English Midlands. And that was a fairly um, well-acculturated, settled society from the later Middle Ages. 
They were language deficient. Thomas Helwes, as a matter of fact, was a, a lawyer trained at Gray's Inn. Um, he knew Latin as well as English, and uh, he really took offense at having to interact with people in the Dutch language. So much so that he wrote what he wrote in response to the Mennonites and to John Smith and others, he, he wrote it in Latin. And so, and so we have uh, Helwes sort of reacting negatively to, to being in Holland. Sooner or later, by about 1611, 1612, Helwes, I think largely for cultural as well as conscience reasons, returned to England and established the first English Baptist Church on English soil. So he was an outgrowth of this very congregation. They were surrounded by English military spies. Uh, it was a fearful prospect constantly to be wondering whether you would be apprehended and taken back for trial. So one of the first words, one of the first scenes, if you will, that this brick would have been a witness to, if you will, following my metaphor, would have been that it, it saw many, many refugees, several of which were our forebears. The second thing that I think our brick would have had uh, a, a clear witness to is something called spiritual worship that is continually referred to through the writings of the pastor, John Smith. What was spiritual worship in distinction with regular worship? Spiritual worship included praying, prophesying, singing psalms, and the sacraments. Smith used it as a contrast with legalism, with discipline, and with heavy liturgy. He also separated what he called scholastical exercises, the sermon, uh, from spiritual worship. Uh, one of the contemporary writers has said, these people talk about spiritual worship as experiential, expressive worship. Maybe today they would be something like we see in our culture as charismatic Christians. They were active in the service. Uh, they were extemporaneous. So our brick would have heard and would have uh, witnessed a new kind of worship among the Baptists that would be quite unlike the Dutch Reformed Church or many of the others, including the Mennonites in the city of Amsterdam. The third aspect that I think our brick gives witness to is a constant reference to Christ. Uh, if any word was repeated repeatedly, it was the name of Christ. Christ was ever present among them. They loved the phrase from the New Testament where two or three are gathered together. That gave them a real sense of empowerment, a real sense of presence. But it wasn't just Christ alone. It was Christ within the Holy Trinity. Smith and others spoke repeatedly about a Trinitarian understanding of the faith. And that won them a hearing with Mennonites and others in later development, that they were Trinitarians just like other mainstream or Orthodox Christians. Now there was something about the doctrine of Christ that was unique about these people not unique in all of Western Christianity, but unique among these people called Baptist. They, they dared to believe that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the whole world, that his atonement covered all of God's creation. And for that purpose, they were called the original Baptist, these friends in Amsterdam, later to return to England, they were called General or General Atonement Baptists. And that's a really important mark because it's some 30 to 40 years later that a second variety of Baptist will emerge, uh, not in the Netherlands, but close to many of the English independents, called um, Particular Baptists. Uh, because among other things, they believed uh, 
that Jesus died for the elect and that it was the elect that he would save and that he would persevere with into um, the heavenly portals. So a doctrine of Christ, our brick would have heard that again and again because Smith came down heavily as did Helwes on that particular theological emphasis. Finally, it was obvious to any brick in the wall, if you will, that um, these Baptists were not sectarians in the sense that they thought they were the only Christians. In fact, very early on, perhaps out of appreciation for their hospitality being provided by Jan Muncher and the Waterlander Mennonite community, they began to open up conversations with the Mennonites. There was, there was real openness about Mennonite views and doctrine. And so, believe it or not, by the 16, uh, 10, 1611 period, uh, you've got Smith actually applying to join his Baptist group to the Mennonite church in single curve. In fact, they finally accepted the Baptist, but not after a, an exchange of various um, theological views. So here we have the beginnings of Baptist identity that is going to be rooted in an ecumenical vision. Now, not all Baptists have been ecumenical, and they still aren't. In fact, um, Helwis resented Smith's uh, flirtation with the Mennonites. And that was one of the reasons why he said, I, I'm sorry, I can't go along with this. You may be my beloved pastor, but I, I can't go along with this. We, we have our convictions. And he wrote out his convictions in something called synopsis of the faith, and he left. Only later did he kind of apologize to Smith and say, you know, I regret that I treated you the way I did, and please forgive me. But the deed was done, and the Baptists joined the Mennonites. In fact, John Smith actually became a recognized elder within the Single Kirk Church. A little story to conclude our brick walk. Uh, Noel Vos and I were on a walking tour of Amsterdam, and we had read in the uh, city archives that John Smythe, S-M-Y-T-H, John Smythe had, uh, had, at the end of his life, taken on several uh, vocations. He was, he was an undertaker, he was a pastor, he was a surgeon, he was a physician, and uh, no doubt a, a good spirit helping out wherever in the community he was needed. He died, and he was buried in the Newkirk, the new church there in the heart of Amsterdam. So Dr. Bose and I walked over to the new Kirk and walked in, and we asked to see the, uh, the verger of the church, and uh, he said, how can I help you? And we said, we are here to see uh, the, where the remains of John Smith, the Baptist become Mennonite, uh, were buried. Where, where can they be found? And the verger looked at us and said, up there, up there. Well, Dr. Vos and I laughed and said, oh, well, yes, of course, all Baptists go to heaven. And he said, no, no, I'm not talking about that. His remains are in the ceiling of Newkirk. And we, we went further and said, well, how can that be? Well, you see, every 100 years or so, before 100 years now, um, at that point in time, the cemetery outside in Newkirk was cleaned and all the bones were taken out and all the bones were simply tossed up in the ceiling of the church among the rafters as a kind of insulation and also so that they would continue to be part of the edifice of Newkirk. So we frowned and we came to the conclusion that somewhere up there, many stories above us in the ceiling, were the remains of the literal remains of John Smith. Now, most Baptists don't go cemetery hunting, and so that was enough for us 
but to realize that John Smith, who had begun his pilgrimage in Lincolnshire, who was a Cambridge graduate, who was trained by one of the best theologians of his era, the eminent Francis Johnson at Cambridge University, who was the great beloved pastor of this group of people, who gathered them as refugees and who took them to a new place. He identified with the Dutch people in Amsterdam and there he ended his days. What a wonderful story it is. And as I think about our brick, it really, Baptists are not into relics. We're not into uh, all kinds of sacred devices that we would uh, pay homage to. But if there's anything close to a Baptist sacred relic, it's this brick. So I often look at it and maybe put it close and wonder what would it say if a brick could talk? I want to end on this uh, humorous note. Baptists love Tim Hortons. Baptists love various places to go, Starbucks, and have uh, a coffee and a donut. The next time you see two or three Baptists together in a Tim Hortons, think about John Smith. Think about Jan Munter. The bakery is our place. The bakery gave shape to our theology. So bless them and maybe even join them. God bless you on this anniversary day.